Great stuff. So I'm going to be continuing our little series, Lost and Found, in the Luke's Gospel. And so <clears throat> we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 12. So let's kick off by reading that. Then someone called from the crowd, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Jesus replied, Friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all of my crops. Then he said, I know, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have enough room to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yet, yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. It's interesting, in Luke's gospel, Jesus talks more about money and possessions than about prayer or worship. Here at Community Church, we never talk about money because this is England and you never talk about money. So we haven't really talked about money for about three or four years. So it falls to me today to talk a little bit about it and what our attitude to our possessions should be. But why do you think Jesus talks about money and possessions so much? And I think it's because it has the potential to distract us like nothing else. That actually money, our homes, our careers, our possessions, stuff has the ability to capture our hearts and imagination and effectively distract us from the kingdom of God. So Jesus is constantly saying to people, pay attention to what's going on with your money. Pay attention to your wealth because if you're not in control of it, it will be in control of you. So this passage that we're looking at is a really interesting one because Jesus goes through a number of little phases as he talks about money. But where he actually starts is less to do with money and more to do with relationships. Because he starts, this person comes to him and says, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, it was very common in, the, in Jesus' day for people to go to one of the teachers of the law to be a judge in a family dispute because the teachers of the law were experts in the law of Moses so you would go to one of them and you would try and get some advice and you would get them to rule about the situation or case that you had so it was very common for someone to come up to Jesus as a rabbi as a teacher to seek his advice but this story does make me laugh because it starts by, tell my brother to tell, divide the inheritance with me. And it just reminds me of something we've all probably done. Mum, mum, tell my brother he's got a share. Tell my sister she's got a share. And it's something I can remember my kids saying. Now, I find it very difficult to share, as my wife will tell you. So <laughs> when we were kind of first dating, we'd go for lunch in the canteen at university. And every day we would get our meals, and every day I would buy a can of Coke. And every day I would say to Marion, do you want a drink? And every day Marion would say, no, I don't want a drink. Then we would sit down, start eating, and she would drink half of my drink. <laughs> now this kept going on and on and on, to the point where the stupid thing about this is why didn't I just buy two cans? I tell you why I didn't buy two cans, because had I done that, she would have said, why did you buy two cans? I didn't want to drink. You can't win. So some of us find it very easy to share. Some of us find it very difficult. But here's the thing. When it comes to inheritance, when it comes to our parents' money, that has the potential to blow families up like nothing else. You might think you're quite good at sharing. You might think you're quite happy to just receive whatever someone wants to give you. But for some reason, inheritance gets under people's skin. There's a TV show called Succession, which is truly, truly horrible. Because basically, it's a family tearing itself apart over the father's wealth. And it's about all the backstabbing and wheeling and dealing that goes on. Now, I don't think anyone's quite as bad as that. But we know that money 
can really drive a wedge between siblings. It can cause real problems in families. Because being brothers is hard enough. It's very difficult sometimes to maintain good relationship with your siblings. That's before you throw money into the pot. And so Jesus here, his concern is when confronted with this guy who comes to him and says, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. He says to him, man, who made me a judge? Or, and the word in Greek actually means divider over you. Now, Jesus here is being really rude. He doesn't say, excuse me, sir. He says, man, which in Hebrew is actually quite insulting. So already we know Jesus is a little bit irritated with this guy's whole approach to life. So the funny thing here is Jesus is saying, actually, you want me to divide your estate between you and your brother. Who are you to make me the divider? So Jesus is saying, actually, relationships matter more than money. I'm not going to get involved in blowing up your family. In fact, the willingness that you show to blow up your own family means I'm already not on your side. That actually, I'm not going to be party to you destroying relationships. And I guess that's the challenge for all of us, is with our children, we long that their relationships would be good. So those are my three sons. I deliberately didn't choose a picture with Abigail in it because she always complains about the choice of picture I make. But anyway... So my longing is that my three sons have a good relationship. That their relationships will always matter more to them than money or wealth or inheritance or their rights. Because here's the thing. This guy has gone to Jesus for what he considers justice. In this situation, he wants what he is owed. So for him, justice looks like getting what he deserves. The problem is, biblical justice is about fighting for what they are owed, not what I'm owed. Biblical justice is never about me. Biblical justice is always about the person who has no voice, the person who's downtrodden, the person who's mistreated. It's not about me fighting for my rights. But how often in life do we demand Jesus agrees with us? That we go to Jesus and say, Jesus, my brother's being an idiot. My friend is being unreasonable. Can you change their minds? We go to Jesus demanding that he be on our side. It's tricky, isn't it? Because <laughs> we often sing songs about Jesus being on our side. And effectively, Jesus is on your side against oppression, against evil, against sin. Is he on your side in every single argument you have with your spouse? No. <laughs> I'm sorry if you think he is. The reality is, justice is about others. And that's the other problem with this little story. So Jesus goes on to say, A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all of my crops. And here's the clue in this parable. He said to himself, top tip. If you're reading the parables of Jesus and one of the characters speaks to themselves, it's a bad sign. Every time in the Bible it says he said to himself in a parable, that is a bad person. That is someone who Jesus is using as an example of how not to behave. Because he said to himself means it's all about him. In fact, in this little parable, he uses the phrase I six times. I, 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 I. It's all about him. So here's a wealthy landowner, probably the biggest landowner in the, re the region, accumulating lots of crops and wealth for himself. But at no point does he engage the local community about what to do with that wealth. At no point does he actually engage anyone else about how he could use that wealth for the benefit of the people who probably work for him and have helped produce it. But also, the dangerous thing, as one writer points out, is he's stockpiling crops, which will drive the price up, further increasing his wealth. This is not a good person. 
So Jesus is comparing the man who comes with him, comes to him with this, this rich landowner. And there's a biblical principle here. In Isaiah, it says, What sorrow for you to buy up house after house and field after field until everyone is evicted and you live alone in the land. And this is the picture here of this rich landowner. Jesus is saying, this desire to accumulate more and more and more wealth for yourself denies other people and pushes other people away. You will become lonely and bitter and alone. And the picture that came to mind was smog in The Hobbit. This idea of accumulating wealth and sitting on it and not allowing anyone else, anywhere else, anywhere near it, defending it with all your worth. But actually, it's useless. It's not doing any good. It's not being put to work. It's not benefiting others. It's not being invested to help others. It's just sitting. And this attitude that Jesus is combating with this parable is also the attitude of the seagulls in Finding Nemo. Mine, 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 mine. And it's an interesting question for us as we go through life. Do you ever find yourself saying, that's mine, mine, mine? I do it all the time, particularly around technology in our house. When my charging cable disappears, especially when my charging cables disappear. When the HDMI cable that connects my laptop to my, la my screen vanishes without a trace. You will find me wandering around the house. Mine, mine, where is my cable? What have you done with my cable? Who borrowed my cable without my permission? I find it really difficult. They're all unreasonable in my family. <laughs> so the question is, when we accumulate things, the famous saying is, how much is enough? And survey after survey after survey has been done of millionaires and people living with very little money. And the answer is always a little bit more than I have now. There was a survey done of churches about church planting. What's the single biggest thing that stops you church planting? We don't have any, enough resources. What amount of resources would enable you to take this next step? About 20% more than we have. That was true for every single size church surveyed. Whether it was a church of 5,000 or a church of 50, 20% more and then we'll be ready to do something. And I think there's something about that principle that actually is true for us sometimes, that actually we might see an appeal for something and we think, actually, I'd love to give to that, but if we had a little bit more money, then maybe I would do it. How much more money do I need? Well, just a little bit more than I've got right now. The problem with this a little bit more mentality is it turns life into a game of monopoly. Because it becomes about accumulation, about getting more, more than I've got right now. And I hesitate to use monopoly because monopoly really doesn't end well in our house. So we don't actually even play monopoly anymore. And if you want to wind Tom up, just ask him about how unreasonable his dad is when they play Monopoly. <laughs> there, was a, there, was one, there was one game of Monopoly that resulted in us never playing Monopoly ever again in our house. Mainly because Tom was trying to blackmail his brother, but that's besides the point. <laughs> so the problem with this idea of Monopoly is when you get enough stuff in Monopoly, you can kind of sit back and just let the money roll in. Once you've got those hotels on Park Lane and Mayfair, Mayfair, you just sit back. Just watch the money rolling in. You don't actually need to buy anything else. You don't even need to make any more effort. You just sit back and watch the cash come in. And that was the mentality of the guy in Jesus' story. Where he says, I know, I'll tear down my barns, big, bigger ones, and then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And then I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored, eat, drink, and be merry. Just kick back on that sun lounger, grab a cocktail, and just watch the money washing in. And actually, what Jesus here is doing is a play on Ecclesiastes. So Jesus, obviously, incredible scholar of the Old Testament, he is using Ecclesiastes to make his point. And here, it looks a little bit like the guy is taking the right approach. Because in Ecclesiastes it says, So I commend the enjoyment of life because there is nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat, drink, and be glad. All sounds very reasonable. 
except the guy has forgotten the second part of Ecclesiastes. Because Jesus is well aware that the next bit of Ecclesiastes says, then joy will accompany them in their toil all the days of life God has given them. So it's interesting in the parable, Jesus then goes on to say, so God says to this rich man, you fool, you will die this very night. His life is in God's hands. In other words, life is a gift from God. And we need to remember that because when we remember that life is a gift from God to us and that we have no control over when that gift might come to an end, it causes us to think a little bit differently about that stuff. I once listened to a talk where the guy said, if you're going to take the monopoly approach to life, what you need to understand is at the end, it all goes back in the box. All that stuff you've worked so hard to accumulate. So Jesus says to him, then who will get everything you have worked for? There's this idea of you want to spend your life accumulating all this stuff, all this wealth, and then you die. Gone. You can't take it with you. It all goes back in the box. Someone else will get it all. So why are you killing yourself working after all this stuff? Because the reality is you don't know at what moment you'll lose control of it all. And actually, when you die, none of it goes with you. We're not Vikings. You're not going to dig a burrow and then put all your stuff in there with you. It doesn't work like that. So the reality is we need to understand that our life is a gift. The stuff we have is a gift. But ultimately, it doesn't belong to us. Jesus says to the, the, rich young, the, the young man who's come to him, life is not measured by how much you own. Which immediately led me to the question of, okay, so what is it measured by? And if it is measured by something, am I winning? This is the question. <laughs> and ultimately, sometimes I hear people talking like this. It's as if there is a scorecard in their heads and they are trying to work out all of the time if they're winning. And unfortunately, our possessions, our belongings, and all these other things are sometimes the scorecard we're trying to use to work out if we're winning. That we think life is measured by the size of our house, the number of people working for us, the size of our bank balance, where we go on holiday, the car we drive, have we got the latest iPhone? We think life is measured by those things. But Jesus turns around and says, uh, 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 life is not measured by what you own. Because for Jesus, life is all about a rich relationship with God. He says, yes, a person is a fool to store up all that wealth for themselves, but not have a rich relationship with God. So the goal of life is a rich relationship with God. And here's the wonderful news. A rich relationship with God starts with God with his love and his grace. It's about what he has done. Now, if we can get our heads around this, that love and grace is about what God does for us, and a rich relationship with God is to respond in love to the love he has first shown us, we begin to realize that there is no scorecard. If life is about a rich relationship with God, not money, possessions, if there is no scorecard, we can live free. We can live with a joy and freedom that a rich relationship with God brings because we're not worrying all the time about how we're doing compared to everyone else. Our possessions are no longer the scorecard. We can invest in God, invest in that relationship with him, invest in his kingdom and find a freedom that comes from not worrying about the stuff, how old your phone is, how battered your car is, how small your house is. You stop playing that game, and that gives you such a sense of freedom. But what does that then mean for our money and our possessions? Because Jesus is clear, your money and your possessions have a role to play, and I think Ultimately, once you realize that life's goal is a rich relationship with God, that your life is a gift from him, all that you have is a gift from him, then stuff begins, becomes something you deploy in pursuit of that. 
that actually life is about investment opportunities in the kingdom of God. Not to return wealth to you, but to see the kingdom grow. Your money becomes a brilliant way that you can invest in things that expand the kingdom. Invest in people's lives. Jesus actually at one point says, sell your possessions and give to the poor and then you will be investing in treasure in heaven. He's saying ultimately there are things you can do with your money that are like you're basically investing in heaven. So if you want to invest in heaven and not in stocks and shares, then be aware and alert and awake to investment opportunities all around you. There are so many ways we can use our life and our possessions to serve the kingdom of God. Because ultimately, God, in his mercy, has chosen to use us, to use your gifts, your talents, your time, your energy, and your wealth to serve the kingdom of God. But I'm not sure it's ever a question we really ask ourselves regularly. Do we do a little MOT every year and actually say to ourselves, do you know what? I'm giving this much time to church. I'm giving this much time to charities, to other organizations, to my neighbors, you know, serving the purposes of God in my community. But where's my money going? Where does all my money go? How much of my money am I investing in the kingdom of God? And I know many people here give very, very generously to lots and lots of different charities and are involved in lots and lots of different things. But I just, we never do this. But the reality is, here we are as a church family. In what, to what extent are we investing in this church family? No one's listening to me now. They're trying to spot themselves in the photo. <laughs> this always happens. I should have just put the logo up. So the question I would ask is, here we are as a family with a mission. God has called us to serve the communities around us. We want to see God's kingdom come in Southmead, in Westbury, in Hembury, on earth as it is in heaven. God has placed us here as a church community to be part of that process. That process takes time, energy, and money. Many of us are giving time and energy but I would question whether we're investing our finance as well in what's going on. So I just wanted to raise that with you as a congregation, as a church family, because like all families, we've got running costs, obviously, like any family. But more interestingly than that, we've also got so many opportunities. There are so many things we want to do here on this estate, in, up at Brabazon, in Westbury. We've got all this stuff we are longing to do, things we can just about see over the horizon that's going to take some money to get it over the line. And so I'd really encourage you to maybe give some thought this week to thinking about how much you give to church and whether there is something you need to review there. Maybe you've never, you haven't looked at it. You set up a standing order 15 years ago and you haven't looked at it ever since. I just would encourage you to maybe have a look and prayerfully consider how that could help. The only other thing I wanted to say on this is I just want to do a little bit of myth busting because there is a rumor going around that the Woodlands Group of Churches has lots of money and therefore the community church doesn't need any. The reality of the situation is that the Woodlands Group of Churches has grown so quickly and we have so many sites now that each congregation is responsible for itself. So this congregation only gets to spend what this congregation raises is the bottom line which is why I'm saying here we have all these vision for what we want to achieve and it's going to take us together giving to enable that to happen. There's no white knight on a steed riding over the horizon coming to our rescue. It's down to us. Finally, let me apologize to anyone who's wandered in this week. This is the one time I've talked about money in the last four years and you chose the wrong Sunday to visit our church. If you are a visitor here today, feel free to completely ignore all of that. But what I want you to remember is this. Life is a gift from God. Our goal in life is a rich relationship with God. And how do our money and our possessions serve that? Amen? I'm going to pray for us. Father God, I thank you that you have blessed us. I thank you that you give us good things. And Lord, we're recognizing today that they are a gift from you. That our lives are a gift and all that we are and have is a gift. And so, Lord, we want to just offer it back up to you and say, Lord, will you show us where we've got it right and where maybe we haven't got it right? I pray, Father, that you'd lead and guide us 
Give us a real wisdom about the way that we use our time, our energy, our homes and our possessions. And as well, our money. Lead us, we pray in this. In Jesus' name. Oh, hang on one sec. I just want to pray one more. No, you, the band can come on up. I just want to pray one other thing, which is, um, I just have a sense that there's some people here today who are basically think there is a scorecard. That even in their relationship with God, there's a bit of a scorecard. That what you need to hear today is there ain't any scorecard. <laughs> That ultimately God knows you, he loves you, and his gift of grace to you is to set you free from keeping score, from comparing yourself to others or thinking that you should be better than you are. So I just want to pray for you in particular. So if, if that's you, what I want to suggest, let's all close our eyes, and if that's you, put your hands out in front of you as a little sign to God that you want to let go. Father God, that scorecard mentality creeps in so easily in our personal lives, in our relationship with you, in our relationship with others. Lord, I just want to pray now for anyone here who is holding on too tightly to that scorecard. Would they be able to let go of it, Lord? Would you flood them with your love and grace now, Lord Jesus? Would you show them that your death on the cross means there's nothing they need to do? That, Lord, you are setting us free from the scorecards that we don't need to compare ourselves to anyone else and that you couldn't love us any more than you do right now. Lord, we thank you for your love and we just want to receive it now. Come, Lord, by your spirit and fill us afresh with your love.